Um, I, I do most of my uh, bee research out at Miami University's Ecology Research Center. Um, and the focus here um, is, again, it's about hive mortality this year. This is where we're really going. So just, just a, a brief peek uh, at what we're going to do here. One, um, it's not a harem scarum thing, per se, but um, I think there are some surprising numbers out there for those who don't monitor or watch these things. And, and this is what is causing part of the concern, um, that it's not just the bees that have a problem, it's beekeepers that have a problem. And so we're trying to address that. And, and one of the ways we're kind of trying to redefine what beekeeping is and what a beekeeper is. So um, I'm going to talk about monitoring in particular. Um, and um, try to take all of this stuff. I've come back from a couple of bee schools and that look that I see in, in new or, or semi-new beekeepers, um, that kind of a brain drain. It's, it just seems like there's, you're assailed by so much information. Everybody has an opinion. Um, you've got um, ABC XYZ tucked under your right arm and hive and the honeybee tucked under your left arm. And where do you go from here? And a lot of times it's so important to keep reminding beekeepers, and I'll stress this several times throughout this webinar, is that when you boil it all down, beekeeping is still pretty easy. Um, and though there are lots of things out there, there are only a handful of things that you have to worry about. There are only a handful of treatments that we have available to us. And the major part really is when to look and when to treat. And so we'll take a quick look at, at some of those, and, and I'll give some examples uh, in particular. Uh, this one, um, I was up in Wisconsin. Uh, I saw somebody from Elkhorn uh, on the list uh, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, in northern Wisconsin. And as I was sitting down uh, that weekend, it just seemed like everything. It was in the local paper. Um, it was uh, just through the trade magazines. I had a couple of days off, so I was catching up on literature, and it was just doom and gloom. And I don't know if that's part of the, uh, the political cycle that we're in right now. Um, for those of you who stayed up late watching the New York returns, my sympathies uh, or my accolades, depending on, on how things went for you, but there just is this presence in the air. And I think new beekeepers are subject to this more uh, distress uh, than other beekeepers. And we're trying to separate fact from fiction here. So when we go through it, though, here the, here's one little caveat that I'm going to throw out here. We hear so much about this topic when it comes to beekeeping, neonicotinoids, pesticides, insecticides. For this particular discussion, the good news is, interestingly enough, the science is bringing forth new testing mechanisms so that we can literally, as it, as it goes here, a simple test, we can look for over 200 different individual pesticides. Uh, the problem is, is that we're finding them out there. Um, the challenge for you as a beekeeper is that um, there's little you can do about that. Um, putting your bees somewhere, we usually talk about location, location, location. You're thinking nectar uh, sources, water resources, um, urban settings versus rural. Um, when it comes to this, particularly here in the state of Ohio, but wherever you are, most of us don't have the opportunity to step out of this problem. If you have a particular um, crop that's growing in your area or, uh, or sprays that are occurring, aside from trying to work with that local farmer, which I highly recommend, um, but given that your bees um, are flying in that roughly three mile radius from your colonies, there's very little you can do to try to mitigate this problem. It's there, it's real. But um, we're going to get to the, to the point where when you see it tucked in here um, in terms of the dynamics of today's problems, this is a little bit of why our heads feel a little befuddled. It just seems that there's just so much going on. And I have to commend, to be honest with you, the strength and the courage of the new faces that keep showing up year after year. Um, maybe it's a little bit of ignorance is bliss. Now, you don't know what you're walking into. But it isn't long before you're kind of beaten about the head and shoulders and told, these are the problems that are affecting our world. What are you going to do about it? So again, some of these we can do things about it. But the problem that I put on here was that it's actually even a little worse than I suggested. And that is, it's one thing to try to identify these particular issues, whether they're viruses, bacteria, nutrition, pesticides. 
But in, in actuality, what's, what's a real challenge for bee researchers and beekeepers is that this is a moving and dynamic field. All of these things are, are literally uh, one season, one thing is, is larger than another. Um, something comes to the forefront, there's a new issue, and there are to be discovered issues. So this is that look that I was talking about earlier. When you walk away and you, you just your eyes are burning with what's going on here. I think I should have gotten an aquarium instead. And why, oh, why, oh, why did I get into this? Well, hopefully we can present some good news after a little more bad news. This is the one that I find particularly problematic. Um, when I go to sleep at night, this one's kind of burned into my retinas. Um, I started beekeeping some 44 years ago. I cannot believe that. I was just this young kid of 10 years old. And interestingly enough, I was a record keeper from back then. And I literally have records to this very day. When I look back, um, when I had started at 12, and I literally had more hives than just my starter hive at 10, um, I started keeping pretty accurate records about winter losses, mortality, um, and, and typically year over year through my uh, junior high and high school years, um, two to three percent uh, were the winter losses, and that was a, a freeze out, a starve out, something had happened. When you look at this map that I just showed you here, uh, it's stunning uh, to look at the mortality rates that we see across the United States. And at some point, we just kind of have to fess up and go, wait a minute. Um, what's really going on here and start to parse this data a little bit. For instance, when you look up at uh, Lower Michigan, I want to know why surrounding Lower Michigan, we have everything from Wisconsin, which I was in at 60% mortality, Pennsylvania, Ohio at almost 50%. I think it's going to be higher uh, when the numbers come in this spring. And why is Michigan at 27%? Um, and some of the uh, Midwestern states, um, much or significantly lower than we are. And I think there's room for encouragement there. And that is um, either there's bad data collection, which is possible, or, or there's bee practices. Uh, there could be genetics involved in that. But more than likely, I'm suspecting that there's education, training, learning, something. And that's kind of where we're headed today. Um, this is the one thing that seems to keep falling out of the data. And that is when we take a look at who lost their hives, um, seasoned beekeepers um, tend to have a much smaller mortality rate than newbies or new beekeepers. Um, and it's significantly so. Um, so much so that um, I, I threw this number out here. I've thrown it before a lot of people and we get a lot of head nods. But when you look at Ohio being around 50%, uh, and I know this is being recorded, uh, so you, you always fear that one of these days somebody's going to throw this little uh, snippet back at you. Um, but 50%, uh, I believe, I, I truly believe from my experience that 50% or more of the mortality that we're seeing in these states is attributable. And this, this is not an accusation. This is just where we are and how bees have changed in our environment. But more attributable to the newer or younger beekeeper because they just don't have that set of, that bag of tricks. That, that, that mindset of, that you develop as a beekeeper. And so in order to be successful, um, you really want to run ahead. So now on to the good side. As I, I indicated when I first started, the good news, after all that bad news, uh, that's just to kind of wake you up this morning, is that we can solve this problem, or a great part of it. Um, I think that right now, given the high mortality that's coming from younger beekeepers, uh, or inexperienced beekeepers in particular, there is no silver bullet. There's no magic pill that's going to come out of any lab or any factory, no miticide, no trick that could reduce mortality more than simply getting on top of beekeeping management practices. Um, we already have some good tools in our toolkit. Um, we already have identified the major pests and diseases that are bothering us. And for those that we have control over, um, the real key here is that just as I, the, the last point here, monitoring is really the key. Um, when we can train your eyes, your brain, to know what to look for, when to look for it, and then what to do about it, and that can become a, metho a methodology, something that you just, it becomes a reflex after a while, then your and the entire beekeeping experience will change dramatically. 
Um, just as an aside, and I don't know why, I think it's a misery loves company thing. Um, we're not alone. Many of you out here, it's just gardening and beekeeping kind of go together. Um, you will see that um, when you walk through this little laundry list, uh, many of you won't be surprised. If you begin gardening, uh, you've got all of these same questions that a new beekeeper would want to ask themselves. Anywhere from what kind of bees, where am I going to get my bees, what about genetics that I'm hearing about, survivor bees, so my seed stock, um, and then the, the timing of things, when to start, when to do this, and then all the other mechanical processes that they have to go through, weeding, watering, uh, spraying for insecticides, herbicides, um, yada, yada, yada. So, again, it, it's not a misery loves company. I'm just, sometimes we, when we get into beekeeping and it seems so complicated, um, what is it, a, a good friend of mine says, um, what is it, transplanting a kidney is easy when you know how to do it. Well, I don't think beekeeping is quite on that scale in terms of complexity. But here is where the problems start. And that is, when it comes to beekeeping, new, beekeep, new beekeepers, it's a kind of you don't know what you don't know problem. Um, and then after that, it's all of these other interesting psychological elements just seem to come into play. Um, first of all, you don't have a knowledge base. So you've heard about some things, but you're not quite sure how true they are. How bad is this Varroa-esque problem? How bad is Nozima? How bad is... And then the other one is after a while, once your head gets filled with all of these and there aren't ready solutions, um, then I don't want to know. I just, I don't want to know. Just, I'm safer. It's a, it's a comfortable, warm spot for me to be in. I'm right here. My bees are great. They're in the sun. I can see them coming and going. There's movement and activity there. They're fine. They're, matter of fact, they're better than fine. I have world class bees. I'm going to enter them in the fair this year. And the fact of the matter is that's not necessarily true. And then the last one, and that is, and I think we all kind of go through this one. Uh, we, it, it's the stages of denial. Um, it's not happening to me. It's happening to my neighbor. It's happening to uh, my neighbor's neighbor. But my bees look good, and it's not. It's not going to happen to me. I take care of my bees. I I meditate over them. I pray over them. Um, I'm hopeful for them. Um, but it's not happening to me. And as you could remember from the map that we saw earlier, um, given the mortality that we're seeing across states, it is happening to you. It is happening to me. It's happening to all of us. And so one of the things we want to do is this all gets back to, again, changing our minds. So how do we do that? Well, this is a tough one. Um, and that is we're literally redefining beekeeping. Um, it is hilarious. It used to be that you showed up at a bee group or a bee club, and along would come this fellow. And it would be how many hives they have. That, was, that seemed to be the badge of courage for literally decades. And somewhere in there, there would be something about the honey crop. Because that, that was what beekeeping was about for a lot of people. Honey production, uh, sideline businesses, and so forth. And so you kind of had, it's kind of like asking, what's your major? You, you would walk into a bee group, and how many hives do you have? And, and what was your honey crop like last year? Now, I literally last night was in a, uh, a bee conference at uh, Xenia, Ohio, and how many times we were asked, the bragging rights went to those who had survivor colonies. Literally, um, instead of hearing the, uh, you hear the doom and gloom stories, yep, I went in the winter with 22, I have six now, um, I had six, I have one now, now, I, literally, there were people that just brushing themselves. I had, I went into the winter with 35, I have 32 now. Or, braggadocious, I went in with 20, I have 20. Um, and so, you start asking yourself, how is that possible? In that map that we looked at, how do these standouts get to be there? How do they have near zero or very small mortality rates? And it turns out that when you look at it, um, they don't, they haven't, a spaceship hasn't landed where they've garnered special genetics. Um, they're not on some inner circle, some skull and bones crew uh, that are sending um, Yugoslavian bees under the wire uh, at midnight so that you've got some genetic stock. But they are doing something. And I'm, and I'm not going to argue that they don't have better stock, but they do have better beekeeping practices for sure. And so what we want to go to here is changing how 
younger or new beekeepers think about beekeeping. So they're more like mature or seasoned beekeepers. And it really seems to be here. Young, younger beekeepers or new beekeepers kind of start with a, a, a prayer, a hope, and a, a kind of an empty reposit, knowledge repository. Again, you just don't know what you don't know. So it's kind of a hands-off. There it is. I put it where it's supposed to be. I've angled it against the horrible southwest winds that blow in the winter time. My hive is slightly tipped forward for the rains. I've done all of these little things. And those are mechanical, and they're important. They can help. But when it actually comes to watching, monitoring, maintaining that hive, it's still pretty much a hands-off. Am I going in too often is, is usually the question. When the answer really is, mm, chances are you're not going in enough. And so we want to go from what's working for seasoned beekeepers, and that is usually they've got their knowledge base in place. They know what to look for. They know when to look for it, and they know what to do about it. And that's what we're trying to change here. Just think again a little bit on the bottom, as I put down here, very much like a, a, a doctor or a detective. You want to look at your hive in a different kind of way. So we're going to define that. Um, I'm going to literally say that modern beekeeping is redefined to be monitoring because it's more descriptive. Beekeeping is this kind of generic or esoteric word. What, is, what does it mean to be a beekeeper? Uh, but when you say I, I'm a monitor, um, all of a sudden it, it's pointed, it's directed, it's, it's an active adjective. I'm doing something. And so in this particular case, all of this noise, all of this clutter can boil down to just three simple principles that I've, I've kind of already hinted at, and that is you know, what, first of all, it's what am I looking at, let alone what am I looking for. Um, when should I be looking? It doesn't do good at certain parts of the season to look for things that aren't there anyway or shouldn't be there. And then finally, a lot of times when we get newer beekeepers to that second tier, they see something and then it's, well, what do I do about it? They, they can't just reach into their kit because they don't happen to have a handful of miticides uh, they don't happen to have a, 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 a tool bag that they can say, oh, that's this, so I do that. Um, and that's what we're going to try to address a little bit here. So let's start at the beginning, the basics. Of all the interesting things, it'll sound strange this way, but you are singularly, all of you, um, are the best monitor going. You are equipped with four and a half million years of evolutionary senses that if you just use them for you, um, you can really do a, an amazing amount of things without having to have specialized equipment. I'm not talking about having to drag a microscope under your arm with a, a long distance cord out to your, your apery and doing microbiotics here. I'm talking about the typical kind of things that will get you through the day. So whether you're, whether as a physician walks into the room, whether you're just looking at that hive from a distance and getting that first macro view and then microing in on it, um, or you're using your sense of smell. Some things don't smell right, some things do smell right. And you'll train those senses to distinguish, say, between American fall brood and a goldenrod nectar flow. There are some interesting learning curves in here. One is not the other. Um, but again, the whole idea here is learning to trust your senses. And I threw this one in for fun just because there are some amazing things going on out there. In particular, I will have to tell you, um, I am new to the whole apotherapy uh, thing. I, I usually always called it a biosmell. I've had the opportunity to stick some whole hives in various labs or classrooms. And boy, if you don't have them vented, and this is a whole hive, not an observation colony, it isn't long before you have that interesting kind of musty, sweet, Polony, larvae uh, um, smell uh, that can overtake a room. I didn't know that people were actually using this. I guess if we listen to music and we uh, do color and aromatherapy, why not apotherapy? I guess. I think another intriguing one is uh, in the far lower right here um, that they're actually have trained honeybees uh, since they're so acute uh, to molecular level smells that um, they can actually be trained. Uh, to have a person blow into a flask and how they exude behavior can literally let you know like uh, dogs uh, sniffing for for uh, uh, contraband um, you can actually determine whether somebody has a, a certain type of lung cancer 
So fascinating, fascinating world we're in. But if you use those senses, um, your sense of smell, it's amazing how that, how much that plays, uh, and how much I, I didn't realize how much I was actually doing that myself. Probably for most of us, uh, the big one is just visual, um, literally looking. And I, I reached into my own bag and I literally just pulled these out and threw them on the table because, again, I, I guess I didn't realize that under certain circumstances, I just used a bunch of different tools. Uh, to do a bunch of different things. Um, when we play around on a macro level, I'll use other tools. Um, we've created hives that we can literally, as you can see, look in. Um, um, this is our Igor hive, or we'll put some small observation hives. And let me not, um, uh, let me actually encourage, one of the greatest things that can happen here is pull up a chair, or on great days when the nectar is flowing, pull out those frames, you don't know bad behavior if you don't see good behavior. And the more time you spend looking at things, the more likely you are going to be to, do, to literally discern what's good from bad and when things are changing. A fun little aside for me here is, and I had some fun with this one, I was literally out in the field one day and I wanted to take a closer look. Um, and I used my, my smart camera, which most of us are using today, and the macro lens just didn't go far enough for me. So I had one of those little aha moments, and I literally took a, a drop of water uh, from my my water jug, and I literally put that little um, lens, if you will, on top of my camera lens. And before you know it, um, these shots that were here were actually the, the two top left were taken uh, by using just a drop of water, or when I get back to the lab, I used a drop of honey because it was more viscous, and it would hold a lens shape and keep that directed. Uh, the point here is there are fun little things that you can play with in the field. You can actually buy these now. I thought I was onto something new, and I was going to uh, uh, talk to a developer. We got into a little bit of, hey, this would be a really cool idea for smartphones to use some hardened plastic, and these would be incredibly inexpensive to make and use anywhere you wanted to, and uh, had gotten into about three levels of conversation, and I found out that somebody in California was doing this already. Um, you can actually buy a roll of lenses at various uh, magnifying uh, uh, stages and literally peel them off like you would stamps on the back of, of a sticky strip and just they're made to be disposable. Uh, they are hardened, so if you keep them, they can you can use them for a long time. But it's just something that you can do uh, in this grand scheme of, of monitoring or taking a closer look at things. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, uh, I, this was pretty amazing. Uh, this is just a standard smartphone uh, with a drop of water uh, on it, and it was amazing uh, how far you can go. So little little things from the, the yard that if you're looking for something on bees or something, um, uh, just something you might want to care to try. Now, now that we're talking about using your senses, the other really big issue now is, okay, so you come prepared, you've got that mindful set, um, but the real key that we find out again here, and this is literally from young kids, 4-Hers, all the way through the newbie age group, and that is just getting into the colonies. And so we, we literally practice something. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a, a bee club here in southwestern uh, Ohio that we, we literally call fire drills. And that is um, as we get into the bee season, we've got to break that barrier between you and your beehive. And we've got to get you in there more often. And the more you're in there, again, obviously, the more you're going to see, the quicker you're going to develop that learning curve. But there seems to be some standoffish. Again, uh, if I go in too often, is that going to harm them? The answer generally is no. I'm, I'm in some colonies every day or every other day. Um, but the big one is you can do a bee inspection in literally three to five minutes, um, period. So that excuse that I don't have time or I'll get to it is usually something else. It probably is, I don't feel like being stung today. That's probably what you're really saying. But again, you can control that by learning. What, the more you're in your bees, the more you'll understand their behavior, how they behave on certain days. You'll pick your times, you'll pick your places, and you will then literally find it a much more pleasurable experience. So if I can... It's get into your hives more and more and more um, and, and get over that, that fear or that, that resistance 
um, and everything starts to work from there. Um, again, visual acuity, um, now that you're in there and you're in there more often, you're going to learn to see things, a lot, lot of things, um, some things you don't want to see, but that's the cognitive dissonance problem. And that is, it is important that you recognize when something is going right, when something is going wrong. And as an example, um, uh, these kinds of things, that, uh, even to this very day, make my heart sing. Um, most of you will be able to understand the behavior here by now, pollen in the upper left, uh, bees stringing and bridging uh, in order to stimulate their wax glands in the upper right, um, a queen cell over here, and, and the color of newly laid eggs and larvae swimming in uh, royal jelly. Uh, again, things, once you're in there more often, you'll just develop a sense of, yeah, this, it smells good, it looks good, everything is good. Then you walk away. And that's what we're actually trying to do here, is we're trying to take away the fear. Because that cognitive dissonance thing will only work, and denial, will only work for you for so long. And then some evening you're sitting there going, well, I wonder what's really going on. Really. Um, and by developing a set of these tools and tricks, for example, um, the previous slide was, this is what it looks like when things look great. This is what looks they look like when things have gone south. And for some of you more uh, uh, serious or attuned or, or in knowledge beekeepers, um, you could probably just about uh, take a little test on these from wax moths to chalk brood uh, to um, American fall brood uh, to the signs uh, in the center middle, uh, excuse me, the center bottom. Um, this is that scattergun look um, as opposed to the one in the far lower right. Look at that beautiful brood pattern. That's the thing that makes your jaws hurt when you're smiling so hard. Top to bottom, left to right. You don't even have to find the queen. You look in there and you go, life is good. This is what it looks like. It smells good. Um, as opposed to the center bottom, um, the brood is there, but it's shotgun scatter, scatter approach. And this usually is a sign of heavy mite infestation. And then finally in the far lower left, um, this looks like you'll see the sunken caps. You'll learn this. Um, this is American fall brood. But the problem is we don't want to spend a lot of time here. It's important over time that you develop this sense. But these these typical kinds of diseases from sac brood, chalk brood, um, American fall brood, very typically in this part of the country, this is a 1 to 3% colony problem. So we don't want to spend a great deal of time now um, as you're learning to get to, to uh, that, that next stage uh, in your beemanship. Um, spending time on things that are, are of low value. So here we go, having just seen what we saw. It's confusing. Our heads start to hurt. I can't do this. I'll never be able to detect this. When it really boils down to this, I said this in the beginning, there are just a few primary pests that you have to worry about. There are just a few diseases that you can do anything about. And we only have a few treatments. It's not like any one of these. Imagine if this was different. What if we had a hundred different pests? We had 10,000 different diseases. And we had 1,500 uh, various treatments that could go into place. Um, I'm often amazed at what physicians can pull out of their hat um, and the database of knowledge they have to have. Not to say that bees aren't complex and we've identified everything that's going wrong with them. But the fact of the matter is for you, the beekeeper, it's just a few things here and a few things there. And this is all within any one of our, our purviews. I throw on the bottom here just because it's important. I'm going to put it back there in the back of your brain. If we also consider nutritional issues, especially later in the summer when the nectar flows are gone, and then ultimately you talk to beekeepers around you. Uh, and this is something that's beginning to start. Remember that bragging rights I told you about? When you hear people that are bragging that they haven't had colony losses or very small colony losses, you want to seek these people out and you want to find out if you can garner resources from them, what they're doing in particular, because we're starting to see little pockets. And I think this is a very um, optimistic time in the beekeeping industry. When we look around the country, they're just as we've seen Varroa mites themselves become resistant 
uh, to our miticides and so forth. Isn't it only fair that after we poison, treat, um, and stress honeybees themselves enough that there are going to be survivor colonies from all of that onslaught? And so we're starting to see little tiny pockets, little hints uh, that there may be survivor colonies that we, we're going to get stuff from. So let's go through just briefly uh, to put this in real perspective and, and, and make it real for people. This is what you need to know when you get all concerned about how many of these pests do I have to worry about. It's right here. Varroa, which is on the top. Tracheal mites used to be a problem. Uh, but it turns out that it's not such a problem now, and we really don't know why. We use grease patties and atomized oils and essential oils, and it turns out that even some of the miticides that we used were effective on these very small mites that lived in the trachea of the bees. But um, when you look back 15, 20 years ago, it was amazing um, at that time that we had had a surge of tracheal mites. There were these bees looking drunken bees in the front of our colony or in the grass. And that, that doesn't seem to be such a problem now. But it makes the list. Um, I'm, I might surprise you with, again, these are primary pests. These are the ones that can knock a colony down. Um, we'll get to secondary pests in a second. They're, they're just more of a nuisance. But interestingly enough, I throw drones in here because many of you probably know by now that drones, aside from many things, they're allowed to drift. They can go from colony to colony, and when doing so, they're usually the ones bringing in diseases with them, primarily Varroa. Varroa is physically on them, or the diseases that they're expressing are in them, and they're allowed to go to another colony, and before you know it, um, it's STDville, and, and things uh, move from there. Another interesting primary pest, if I will, a way of looking at this, because this is how I want you to think about these colonies in the future, is queens themselves. If your queen is not functioning, um, and I, I say this, and, I, and I, I don't mean to be disparaging here, um, but queens seem to be one of those um, denial and cognitive dissonance moments. Mine is great. Look at her. She's beautiful. Gorgeous. She's huge. She's plump. She's bulbous. She is beautiful. Her physical appearance has really little to do with it, aside from the fact that you could sometimes notice these kind of micro queens that really didn't develop well. The key here is monitoring her laying behavior. We'll talk a little bit about that. But it's literally how is your queen performing? And if your queen isn't performing well, she's not laying properly, she wasn't mated properly, um, uh, etc., she literally becomes a pest to, to the, the colony and a real problem for its future survivability. So as we define primary pests, something that can take a colony down, even queens have to be looked at under a new light. And, and I recommend, just as a quick aside, that to be honest with you, we should adopt a negative uh, on, on this, and that is you should walk in with my queen is bad or malfunctioning or dysfunctional until she proves otherwise. And we do that by putting in frames of foundation or drawn comb and watching her laying pattern, watching what's going on. She can be impinged by other things going on in the colony, but often she herself is expressing whether or not that's a VW engine um, in that Ferrari beehive of yours or not. And so we should literally look at her with a critical eye. And, and then I actually, as a pest, and, and don't take this personally, um, you, and not the way people think. People used to think it's because I'm bothering my bees too much. When the fact of the matter is today, given the pests and disease problems that we have, that are very handleable, by the way, um, it's just that we're not in there enough. We don't see things coming and we tend to be reactionary, and so it takes a, uh, instead of uh, an ounce of prevention, it takes a pound of cure uh, to get to the other side. So um, that will take your colony down. If that's our definition of what a primary pest is, welcome fellow pests. I'm as guilty as many of you are, depending on my schedule. Secondary pests, and, and then we're done. Secondary pests will include some of the other things you've heard of. Small hive beetle. I wonder about this one. Um, for s most colonies, probably 98-99% of them, small hive beetle in the far lower right um, is a secondary pest. It's a nuisance. It's a bother. 
Um, but it's not a game over, a game changing event. But I have been in colonies that it has. And depending on where you are in the, in the country, um, some of you would agree with me. Um, a secondary uh, issue is wax moths uh, next to the hive beetle. Um, secondary because they're usually not a problem. If you have a wax moth problem, you usually have a primary bee problem first. Um, bees will not tolerate an excessive amount of wax moths when they come up seasonally um, and so forth. And I'll just buzz through the rest of these because, again, whether it's ants or other things that are bothering our colonies, um, they're not primary. Uh, they're nuisances. You'll see them, um, but if you put them in that nuisance category, you can dismiss them uh, for the most part and, and move on. Um, I did I did throw this in for the small hive beetle. Um, uh, some of you, it is a problem. It's a real problem. But for most of us, again, like some of the diseases I mentioned earlier, if this is a 1 or 2%, you only want to spend so much time thinking about it. It's just important that you see them, you recognize them, so that when you get into your colony, you're not surprised, um, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, the bigger pests I don't worry about. Um, I find out that carpet tack strips will take care of just about anything from skunks and raccoons and possums and so forth. And when it comes to bears, uh, some of my people uh, that I saw that were on in Wisconsin, my, my sympathy goes out. Uh, there are so many black bears uh, around. Um, but if you're beekeeping in an area that has these, you kind of have an idea of what's going on there. So uh, little you can do about them anyway, um, but uh, just aware. Uh, there's some, there are some measures that you can take. Okay, so we're off of pests. So that, as I said to you before, there's just a handful. And of that handful, there's a half a handful that you have to be truly concerned about. When it comes to diseases, pathogens, again, so many of these, there's so little you can do. I put in here Nozima, uh, a gut disease, um, American fall brood, European fall brood, sac brood, chalk brood. These express themselves, um, but there's so little you can do about them other than when they, when they really take over a colony. Um, you can, if you get a huge, uh, a case of nosema or gut disease, you can actually, this is when you can drag a, a microscope out to the field and you can test for this. We're hoping that kind of around the state we're going to find, there's usually that Radio Shack guy uh, that's in uh, every bee club that just loves tinkering with this kind of stuff. And it wouldn't be long before, whether you're just doing a visual examination of the color of the internal gut um, or you haul out a microscope and you do a spore count, um, and see whether or not you're in unacceptable limits. Um, but for the most part, for most of us, these are things that you really can't treat for until they really, really become a problem. And you're usually calling on some other beekeeper to get some other eyes involved. So the worst part about this one, and this is probably where I feel the most helpless, is that there are a lot of viruses that, we, that are expressing and we see themselves. But there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, human bacteria are one thing. You take antibiotics. Human bacteria are another thing altogether. Uh, think of AIDS as an example, what it's taken for us just to understand it, let alone try to cure it. And so here we are with these issues. And so we can identify them. It's important that we work along when you see bees, like in the upper right, with these kind of deformed or K-wing. Um, this is a particular virus that expresses itself. The key here is there are no inoculants. There are no treatments for this. Let your eyes know that this can happen. If it starts reaching bigger levels, usually the problem is, interesting, that most of these pathogens, most of these virus, bacteria, spore issues, they don't literally express themselves until the colony has a certain mite threshold or a fever, if you will. And your job is if you can monitor for these varroa mites that I mentioned, if you can watch them seasonally build up and then knock them down if they're crossing certain thresholds, and you keep those thresholds low, a lot of these, interesting, a lot of these pathogens don't express themselves. Um, so um, this is one of the things that we can do something about. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but finally we get to the point of what to look for, when to look and uh, the treatments that are available. Um, I am sure you've got a, uh, a notebook full of, of things, but this is a field that's changing too, and, and we are ready for it. 
Um, we used to have uh, miticides that came on to, to literally lower these mite levels. Um, and they went under the, the heading of hard chemicals. Um, they were inorganic chemicals. Um, I'm not picking on anybody, but it's what we had at the time. And as this field evolves, we've now gone to soft chemicals or organic chemicals. And um, our options and choices out there are, are, are still pretty varied um, and pretty effective. Uh, but like so many things, um, timing has to be a critical component of that. So a, a quick little aside here. This is kind of a classic. Uh, IPM is, a, is an acronym for um, Integrated Pest Management. As a beekeeper, you are going to have mites. There is no denying it. So we step over that threshold. It's how many mites do you have and when. And so you're going to, going to have to adapt an attitude that somewhere in this season, more than likely, I am going to have to stop green beekeeping and beekeeping by faith, and I'm going to have to treat for mites. And then you're going to get into a cycle of treatments where you don't keep using the same treatment over and over again. So some of these softer organic chemicals that seem to be uh, the record of choice today, whether it's formic acid or oxalic acid, amitraz or thymol, you can use these one year over another year versus no treatment. Just, again, at this stage in development, it's important that they're in your, your vernacular. You just know that, that there are treatments out there for mites. You know that there are hard and soft treatments. We now prefer the soft because they don't have the same type of wax residue and buildup over years uh, that the uh, harder chemicals have and are gentler on the bees. Um, and then you have to understand that you are going to be doing this and you're going to have to put it in some sort of a timely cycle. Um, so again, a quick little refresher uh, before we move on here, a deep breath. Um, there are problems out there. Um, we are past the cognitive dissonance denial phase. And, and there, these issues are critical. They're high. In particular, for the newer beekeepers listening, you in particular are very susceptible uh, to these very issues that we talked about. Yet, there are a lot of beekeepers who are finding success uh, in today's problematic bee world, and they're doing so because they're using something like monitoring, and that is build a, a repertoire or a knowledge base of what few pests and diseases that are out there, um, understanding what treatments that are out there, and knowing when to look. And I'm going to concentrate a little bit on that one. For me, this is, seems to be a real critical component. It's not just doing something, it's when you do something that can make all the difference. So for many of you, um, if you look at uh, general curves, and these, these can be broken down, um, it, it, there's a kind of a gut feel, there's kind of a bell curve, if you will, uh, at the height of the summer or going into the summer, the colony uh, builds to a peak, a crescendo, and then it falls back off again. It just seems to make sense. Um, our honeybees are very reactive organisms. Um, when you have heat, light, uh, nectar, uh, the colony is going to expand. When those things start to, to fall off, any one of them, those colonies will contract. That's what they've been doing for 150 to 200 million years. Also, with these, um, one of the curves that goes along with this is look at the curve in the far lower right. Um, this is the population curve of bees and then the population curve of mites. Notice they're kind of the same thing. They'll rise and fall in roughly the same arcs, but they're a little out of phase with one another. In other words, as the bees build up slowly because the mites are laying in the cells and hatching out, the mites trail in the beginning of the season, and then they begin to literally go past the, mite popu uh, the bee population as the bee population is starting to wane after midsummer going into fall, which literally means that the, it looks in the mite population is exaggerated because now you have more mites than bees in your colony. So when you were to go out today, uh, early in the year, if you look down and see April, um, if you were to come back and say to everybody, hey, I monitored for mites, I don't have them, I'm a great beekeeper, life goes on, tuck it away, see you next year. The problem is, is that if you look there, your bee populations are starting to climb, as we know, in April, but the mite populations should still be low. And so when you test for them now, it shouldn't be surprising, unless you have an anomaly, that they are low. 
It's when you have to test for them. And look again, it's literally as those mite populations start to climb uh, in June, in July. This is when you have to get on top of it. This is when you have to test for them. Um, this is an old one. Uh, some of those who have been in beekeeping for a while. I threw this one up here only because I love the, the fact that when you go back in the old literature, uh, mites were not around over 25 years ago. This wasn't a problem. We, this is a new problem in a new age. It used to all be about just colony management. And book after book, you'll find they told you what was blooming and when, if you look below, how you should be supering up your colonies, many of you wish, um, and what the, the, the population of eggs, brood, and larvae, and thousands of bees would look like through the season. It was all about management, hive management, not our world anymore. And that's, that's the important part. We've got to realize that we're in a new world, and I think to a certain degree, new beekeepers have an advantage there. Um, older beekeepers are still trying to unlearn uh, some of the things they thought they knew or practices that they thought would work, and you're kind of stepping into the middle of this, so I, I think it's kind of, you know, so you're going, so what? Uh, it's, no, it's not a big deal. From the day I thought about beekeeping, I've heard of this stuff. It doesn't really surprise me. And I think, again, you have a real advantage there, as long as one of the takeaways here on these B curves and light curves is that it's the time of the season. Um, so it's not only important what you do, when you look, but also when you treat. And if you're doing things at the wrong time, obviously doing things at the and I uh, doing things at the wrong time doesn't help. But you can break this down into simpler curves. I'm going to find somebody who's better at graphics than I am. I like to consider the season, if you're into honey production, in two kind of big circles. Um, one is you, you, you stimulate and you work to get that spring-summer uh, honey flow and that buildup. And then that nectar dearth occurs come the end of July into August, um, which is a critical time uh, to be feeding. We'll talk just briefly about that. Um, and then that's a great time to be thinking about making splits or doing something else, checking for mites at that time. That's that critical phase uh, when mite buildup can get high. And a great time for doing treatment because you don't have honey on it. Uh, bees are sitting on the porch waiting for fall, the fall rains, the fall flows to come again. But you as a beekeeper can take proactive steps to jump in there. Uh, and yes, I will clean this up, hopefully, uh, by the time anybody wants to download this uh, in the future. But when you put all this together, again, the point here is that there are a lot of things going on here. Whether it's the nectar flows whether it's the mite colony buildups, whether it's the bee populations, and then the light and temperature, all of these things are kind of in a dance and reflecting one another. And that's how things got to be the way they are. So understand that this is kind of like a piece of music playing, your favorite song. Um, and there's a certain point in here that you have to do or listen for certain things. It's just not a repeat. And that's a big takeaway in the whole monitoring methodology. So a couple of quick examples of what I mean by that to, to kind of harden that. Um, if you were looking for wax moths right now because you were concerned, wax moths migrate uh, throughout the season. Um, come the cold weather in the, in the fall, they literally die off. They don't make it here. They're, they're not indigenous uh, to uh, the North America. Um, and so they'll come on as the season greens. So about July, and there are exceptions to all of these rules, that's when you start looking uh, for wax moths. Uh, looking for them now um, is just a waste of time. And treating for them, certainly. I gave you another example uh, to kind of bring it closer. Our biggest nemesis today, the number one pest, primary pest, Varroa. But again, take a look at these two curves and pay attention to the dates on the bottom. Knowing when to look for Varroa mites. And notice on these two examples, in, in terms of the number of mites per 300 bees or 100 bees, um, we literally go from a uh, June of six mites uh, per 100 to as the colony falls uh, to literally 25 mites or more. And if you get to this point, this is kind of an extinction event. It may take a while. It may take them uh, into the winter to die out, but chances are when the mite populations reach this point, those pathogens that I mentioned that express themselves are going to show their ugly heads, and you're going to see virus expression, bacterial expression, and your bees are literally going to have, there's a great line, I think Randy Oliver gets credit for this one, bees do really good until you blow holes in them. 
And it turns out that uh, Varroa mites, from a large macro perspective, literally eat into our bees, drink their hemolyph, uh, their bee blood, if you will, and, and make holes in our bees, and they don't too well with that. Um, aside from transmitting diseases at that point, and then all of a sudden the disease is expressed, and we can get things like nosema or a gut disease. And those literally blow holes, holes in bees' guts. Um, and then they don't do so well, as you, as you well imagine. So the key here is to look at where we are in the season for monitoring along the way, checking the levels of these concentrations. And I'll give you a quick, short, dirty little uh, example of how to do that. Um, and then treating accordingly when it's time to treat. It doesn't do you any good to treat for or after. It's knowing when to treat. And that's a, that's a little bit of the takeaway. Um, I'm going to skip this for now. Um, many of you are probably uh, uh, blurry-eyed with these kinds of things, but I'm just going to encourage you for my sake, it's an occupational hazard, get to understand a little bit of hive physiology as well. It's a good thing for you to know how long it takes for a worker or a drone or a queen to hatch. Um, they all have different incubation times and cycles, and mites are associated with that. Um, so that, that there are just one of those things that you can look at and do. Um, I borrowed this one from uh, Randy Oliver. Um, these are examples of things that you can do timely in the monitoring process. And I want to throw this out. We, we're gifted by having this uh, lecture this time of the year. Um, this is a little uh, break that you may want to come and look at later on. But if you literally um, pull the queen out after the, your, your first big uh, honey run um, for the summer, and there's nothing else there anyway, and take her out of there, you will break that brood cycle uh, that I showed in the previous slide. Let everything hatch out. And that's a perfect time for you to monitor for mites in late July, August. You have no queen that's laying in there right now. You can put her in a nuke or another colony to bank her temporarily. Let everything hatch out of that colony. And then if you have to, and the monitoring says the mite loads are getting high, you can not only treat them and knock them all down. They're not hidden. They're not buried under caps and in, in larva and pupa. But at the same time, the queen's not in there. So you're not exposing her to miticides. And I know that's a lot to take in. But we, we just can't, as we get into the beekeeping season, it's the varroa season. And that's why I'm kind of ending on this kind of a hardline metaphor. When we first started looking, um, we would literally use a cap scratcher or something like that and pull uh, drone larva out that you see in the bottom lower left and these little pepper dots that you see. We, we learn to explore and see them first, but we've come a long way. Some of you have then migrated to using sticky boards, see what you could put in a miticide or, or something, and you would have this mite fall, and you could do a count on these squares. The problem with it was is big colonies and weak colonies had the same squares. So when you're counting, how many mites with a weak colony, a medium colony, or a large colony didn't give you a very accurate count. So we've kind of taken things to this next level, and that is, believe it or not, uh, my favorite is a couple of plastic peanut butter jars with a screen in between them that you duct tape. You literally uh, uh, pour uh, a, uh, two tablespoons of powdered sugar in one end. You scoop up a third of, of uh, bees from the brood nest, uh, uh, put them into the other end. That's about 300 bees. You do a shake like you're putting a martini together. Um, for about 45 seconds to a minute, and then you dump them with that screen in between. You're able to pour the powder down to one side. You can then take that mite-infested uh, powdered sugar, pour it into a white coffee filter is my choice, uh, pour a little water over that. The water seeps through, and you're left with a nice little bee threshold or a count. So <clears throat> I want to kind of review where we've been um, and you can, you can look at this, but I think you're kind of getting the idea here. We're trying to redefine beekeeping and take some of the uh, things out of the way that have been causing us problems in the past. And um, I think Denise did that. Uh, we'll, we have to wrap up in just a second. But everybody's asking for hard practical knowledge. Let me give you one here. Here's a couple for you that you can just put in your pocket. Uh, so if you want to come back and look at this, I encourage you. It's a read. Um, but it's the things that I've been saying. Um, you, if you're going to be a beekeeper today, another way of saying monitoring is to use other words uh, to get you there. 
Um, but it, it basically is understand that today to be a beekeeper, you're a Varroa keeper. You're a monitor of Varroa. And so I've spent a lot of time on that, but I want to stay at the 10,000 foot level and I would really want to concentrate a lot more on what it means to be uh, a beekeeper today or a bee monitor. Um, we have, um, my last little note out here is we are actually trying to build uh, a monitoring kit. I've uh, been tasked by OSBA uh, to put together what is called an APRI diagnostic kit uh, that uses the whole methodology of monitoring. So we're going to put together a little hardware kit so it's going to be kind of a metaphorical reminder. You go out to your, your bee yard, you've got your kit with you, but in that kit is going to be literature that literally helps. First, there's a calendar telling you when you are, where you are in the season, what you should be looking for, and then some uh, nice glossy uh, little things of good things and bad things. Um, back to our previous look that, that you've seen that can help get you there, um, and you can compare and contrast. And once you see something, some directed hints, because now you've, you've seen something, you can share something, what do I do about it? So um, time for any questions. I know I, we started just on time, so that was kind of a, a head full. Happy to take any questions that anybody has.